So welcome again, everyone. My name is Zach Davey. I am an admissions officer at RISD, Rhode Island School of Design. I am also the regional representative for international students. Um, and I'll be giving today's presentation. It's uh, generally on portfolio tips and we'll have time for Q&A afterwards. And I'll pass it to my colleague, LJ. Hi, everybody. I'm LJ. I am also admissions officer at RISD. Um, I'll be kind of working in the background today, um, kind of chat managing and um, answering your questions in the background. Um, there will be an opportunity for question and answer at the end. So I'll save some questions for then as well. Um, please use the, there's like a Q&A chat box function for questions. So please type your questions in there. Um, it should be a little bit you know, at the bottom of your of your Zoom screen um, to the right. So again, use that Q&A chat box um, and I can answer your questions through there. Awesome. Thank you, thank you. I'll go ahead and share my screen. LJ, does uh, everything look okay on your end? Yes, yeah. Awesome, thank you, thank you. I'll go ahead and turn off my video for the duration of the presentation as well. Um, but yes, welcome again, everyone. So you're probably all here because you're considering art schools or art programs, and that's fantastic. Um, the most important part of your application to almost any art school will be your portfolio. So the really broad definition of a portfolio is a collection of examples that showcase your thinking and making in your creative practice. But the portfolio you put together for your RISD application has additional specifications and parameters. All art schools have different portfolio requirements and look for different things. So in this presentation, I'm going to go in depth about what RISD specifically looks for in a portfolio. So let's start with the basic requirements. Your RISD portfolio is meant to be a highly curated, limited selection of just your strongest examples of your visual artwork. You'll use SlideRoom, an online portfolio platform to submit your application to RISD. In SlideRoom, you need to include at least 12 pieces and you'll have up to 20 slots that you can fill. The limited space of the application portfolio requires careful selection of pieces to include and deciding which pieces to exclude. Please include only the pieces that you feel are the strongest, most interesting to you, or the most unique to you. This can include process and preliminary pieces. This can include sketchbook pages. This can include design or architectural work. You will use the online portfolio application side room to submit your portfolio to RISD. So this requires digital documentation of your work. And I'd also like to clarify too, uh, we no longer require the RISD assignment. If you see anything online about a RISD assignment, please know that that was a past requirement. And as of now, we no longer require it for seeing your visual artwork. We just require the portfolio of 12 to 20 submissions. So generally, when we're reviewing your application's portfolio, we're looking for your creativity, personality, risk-taking, experimentation, unique ideas, curiosity, and thoughtful visual decisions. It's also helpful for reviewers to see how you think, how you take your initial idea and develop into a final piece. This can include sketches, studies, storyboards, 3D model studies, or prototypes, just to name a few. You can include your research into a specific subject matter, the development of a new technique, or learning a new tool to aid your ability to produce a final piece. When we review your portfolio, we also look to see if you'd be a good fit for how RISD teaches. Your RISD education will begin with the Experimental and Foundation Studies Program, or EFS for short. We take all incoming first year students and we'll divide you into sections of 20. And as a section, you'll take three studio classes. You'll take design, drawing. In this drawing class, the student here made her own drawing tool by taping an eraser to a long stick. So, uh, Definitely try to make your own drawing tools, work in unconventional ways. And lastly, the third course is spatial dynamics, or a fancy word for 3D design. Students in this class design and build their own musical instruments. Um, so it's a good idea to keep the EFS classes in mind when putting together your portfolio. Again, since all first year students begin their RISD education in the Experimental and Foundation Studies program, this means that you will not be applying directly to a major. This means that your work shouldn't be restricted to one interest or medium. 
It's a good idea to consider general values that we hold near, like experimentation, process, conceptual thought, creative problem solving, and technical skills. One question we hear all the time in admissions is what, important, what is more important, technical skill or concept? I want to start with these two ideas. So first, when we say technical skill, what do we mean? So we're referring to how you purposefully use your materials to achieve a finished piece or endeavor. Here are some key terms to consider when you think about technical skill, composition, mark making, texture, movement, color, space, point of view, and light. So I can show you some examples. So composition, how do you arrange all the different elements within a piece? I want to emphasize too, uh, our eye moves throughout the entire piece here, not just the center. We see a lot of uh, students when they submit their portfolio, they'll center their subject matter. Um, so yes, uh, the, be aware of that. You know, um, be, think about the composition and how, again, our eyes can move throughout the entire framing. How can you arrange all the different elements? It's another example using photography and digital drawing. I see a question in the chat. If you don't mind, could you repeat what we look for in the portfolio? There was a drop in connection. Um, the rest of the presentation from here on out, we're still in the beginning. So the presentation will cover that um, going forward. Mark making is another thing that we look for. Um, mark making, uh, some of you might not be familiar. Uh, mark making refers to all the different marks coming together in a drawing to, uh, yeah, how, how do all these different marks come together and what are the different qualities of these marks? For example, a pen mark uh, will have a very different quality than say a large paintbrush going throughout a canvas. They have different textures, opacities. Um, thicknesses and uh, all of these different marks coming together is what we refer to with mark making. So we do in, like to see varied mark making, seeing that you're trying different approaches of creating marks on a canvas, piece of paper, or in any other medium. Texture on a similar note, the literal feel of a tactile surface or material, or the appearance of a tactile surface or material. You'll want to consider something like texture when making architectural drawings as well. In Mark Bradford's paintings, texture drives this process. He starts by covering his canvas with at least 10 layers of papers, as well as embedding linear elements like string. Then he attacks it with power sanders and other tools to expose earlier layers, flashes of color, and unexpected juxtapositions. Not until the first sanding does he begin to see where the painting is going. So I think that's a great example of a very unconventional approach too. We love to see unconventional approaches and how do they create uh, unconventional final outcomes. Nafis White made a series of sculptures made entirely out of hair and hair accessories inspired by the Victorian era tradition of art crafted from hair of deceased loved ones. In these pieces, they honor African-American hairstyling techniques, celebrates the inventive, inventiveness, care, and love that's shared between people, especially Black women. Also, be sure to think about texturing your digital pieces too. Um, drawing tools created in programming software, processing, exported as PDF files, uh, or um, are shown here as well. Processing is a fun tool to try out. Uh, programming for art and sign purposes as well. I've used processing a lot as well in the past, and there's also P5JS is another great op option. Also think about space too. Um, in two-dimensional work, how you create the illusion or dimension or purposeful point to the flatness of a surface, how you create or purposefully not create a sense of foreground, middle ground, receding background, this can also refer to how you physically place your piece in a room or a digital platform. Point of view, how you compose your piece in relation to the viewer. In other words, is the viewer looking at the subject from below, from behind, from one mile away? Light, how do you use areas of light and dark to create an illusion of space, a sense of mood, add emphasis in your piece? Sorry, the slide had some trouble loading for a second there. I think light is great to think about when you document your uh, sculptures and 
uh, other three-dimensional work as well. Think about how the lighting is affecting the piece. You can also consider the color and temperature of the lighting. Here, it's kind of cold, early morning light, just like Providence, Rhode Island <laughs> at this hour. Um, it makes the piece feel very empty. Uh, this is a warm late afternoon light, like Providence lighter today. Um, it feels much cozier. Color, how you use hue through materials and surface. One question that we hear all the time, oh, oh well, sorry, I, <laughs> I should have said that. Um, what I want to say is that we want you to challenge you, yourself to use your technical skill to go further than just an exercise about technique. Um, that is the important thing here. Uh, technical skill is great to see in the portfolio, but we don't want to see pieces that are just showcasing technical skill. We want to see how you can really push this further in different kinds of creative endeavors. So some key ideas going forward to about concept or mood, idea or concept, narrative, and goal. So mood, the feeling or impression that the piece leaves on the viewer. For example, the two very different moods uh, showcased here. Um, also, for example, Joy's work here, the warmth of a mother spoon and a baby spoon nestled within, even industrial design work can show. Um, a warmth and mood in this kind of way. Sorry, my slides were having trouble loading for a second there. Um, but also idea or concept, what you want the viewer to start thinking about when they look at or interact with your work. This can be a particular point of view or set of values. This can be large or small scale issues. For example, comparing the horrors of war with privileged consumerism. Narrative, the story your piece tells. This can be an illustration of linear series of events, storyboard, or a suggestion of a story. For example, little, the entirety of the story of Little Red Riding Hood is shown on the left here. Goal, especially with design-based work, um, how is your piece functional? What kind of type of problem is your piece trying to solve? For example, this is a uh, gardening, tool, gardening tool for arthritis patients. So again, uh, RISD does not define technical skill as photorealism too. We, we don't need to see photorealistic work. Uh, we want to see that you are um, still experimenting even while working on your technical skill, that you're still showcasing your own personality and uh, your own interests as well. This also does not mean that your concept have, concepts have to be huge or lofty. I think a lot of the work that I showed just now had wonderful concepts and meanings, but uh, they didn't always need to be huge or lofty as well. They can really be personal and unique to you. I think that's what's most important to us. So uh, we also want you all to vary your process to try to avoid making the every piece the same exact way in your portfolio, try out different processes, different methods to create all of your work. And when we say vary your process, this does not mean that you have to bounce around to every material and try every discipline in the world. If you're not interested in architecture or oil paint, you don't have to try it. We just want to see that you're working outside of your comfort zone and trying different things. Avoid formulas as much as possible as you work on your portfolio. Very different takes on portraiture. It's a great example. Maybe turn your character design into a wearable costumes. Think about how you can push your pieces in different ways. Excuse me. Uh, for example, this piece here is called Nostalgia Monster. Uh, it's a character an animation mixed with material experimentation, and then finally made into a wearable piece. Mark making is not restricted to drawing. Try to think about this with every discipline and material you use. Um, so even if you like working in one discipline like photography, consider how you can experiment. Lighting, if you're interested in portraiture, consider the background, have fun with setting up different textures or patterns. It does have to be expensive photo paper. 
Dennis uses turf, orange plastic fencing, aluminum foil, blinds. Be sure to have fun with it. Play with the shadows. Layering is important to think about. Collaging. Mixed media. I always encourage for students when working on their portfolios. Here's some mixed media with photography. Pebbles on top of a crumpled photo of a bird's nest or empty threads of spool on top of a portrait. Think about digital manipulation with photography. So yeah, so those are some examples for photography specifically. And remember that a strong drawing can look like so many different things. I recommend including some pieces based on direct observation. This means that working from real life people, objects and places in front of you, so not working from photos or videos. I discourage drawing from photographs in general because this will often lead to flattened or distorted drawings. Again, your drawings do not have to be photorealistic. A strong drawing can look like so many different things. Try making your own still life. Uh, still life. Image on the right is what the still life looked like and the image on the left is the final drawing. One thing, um, I'm going to go back to this photo as well, because I think another great part of it, maybe there's another example later on, but I just want to emphasize that the student on the right is looking at what they're drawing to, that uh, be sure as you're drawing from observation to really look at what you're drawing and not always the paper that you're holding. Also try drawing what's around you. Um, Tara describes that my mother's house is a messy house. The piles of random clutter found in almost every room are a manifestation of and a metaphor for the strange, complicated relationships and emotional intensities of the house. We're cluttered, frustrated, loving folk, my mother and I, it's complicated, but it's our house, is a quote from Tara. Draw outside as much as possible to bring your sketchbook, go outside. Feel free to experiment with color in your drawings. I think this is a great example of that. Try drawing buildings around you. Draw from observation again, nature, bring your iPad with you if you're working digitally or your laptop. Um, bring a sketchbook, pens, color pencils, whatever medium. I've even seen wonderful sketchbooks where students have uh, used non-drawing materials. Like I've seen students use pieces of fabric and uh, other elements, um, pieces of wood that they found, glue, sticks uh, to make their drawings in their sketchbook. That's always uh, really exciting to see. Some more examples. Even in your sketchbook, still consider mark making and layering. So here are some things that we recommend avoiding as well. Digital tools allow easier and faster execution. For example, recreating a photo with oil paint is difficult while recreating a photo digitally is largely trivial. Criteria for 2D digital art is exactly the same as those for physical materials, depending on the intent of the creator. Consider the mastery of the use of balance, color, drawing skill, expressive composition, harmony, light, mark making, sense of space. I know this is for the what to avoid um, uh, slide, but my point is to avoid having digital art feel separate <laughs> from everything else. You know, you can uh, really experiment as much as possible uh, with your digital work. And I would recommend doing so. Even with digital work, we are still looking for all of the things that I mentioned earlier in this presentation, concept, mood, narrative, uh, texture, mark making, all of these things are just as important with digital work as they are for physical work. But yeah, going forward, some other, uh, some things that we recommend avoiding. So master copies, uh, please don't include master copies in your portfolio. They can be great to build your technical skill, um, but they don't give us any insight into you as an artist. For, to clarify for everyone, master copies are recreations of an artwork by another artist, usually a famous artist, but can be from anyone else. Uh, same thing for fan art for the same reason as well. We don't want to see you working from other people's designs or creations. We want to see your designs and creations. So please do not include master copies and fan art in your portfolio again. Uh, please don't include anime as well. Anime, 
is uh, such a set style that it's difficult for students to break out of it and really develop their own style within anime. So um, it's great to be inspired by anime, but I would encourage you all to be inspired by, say, compositions or a sense of drama rather than just stylization. And then lastly, uh, if you're interested in architecture or interior design, um, please do not include traditional floor plans in your portfolio. We still want to see your creativity and unique points of view, even in your architecture and design work. And lastly, uh, please, please, please do not submit your portfolio in this format. Uh, LJ can attest to this <laughs> as well. Um, it makes it very difficult for us to read your portfolio uh, when we see lots of tiny bits of images and cluttered text and titles all over the place. Um, we just want to see simple, easy to see images of your work. And please don't include text on the side itself, like title, medium, and description. Um, there is a side column to insert all of that information for, again, title, medium, and description can all be inserted in the side column. So please do not include it in the image. I think up to three images is okay to include in a single image slide. But if you do have a piece where you want to show several images of process or um, say several angles of a sculpture and it goes over three, to, uh, three or so images, I'd recommend uploading a video slideshow. That way it can still be one slide in your portfolio, but we can see all of the photos nonetheless. Um, there's no time limit length on that video, um, well, but it helps us see the work uh, individually, we can scrub through and see different parts of the images and focus in on them while still seeing them as large as they could possibly can be. Doesn't need any fancy editing or anything. And then just to answer the question too, um, video art and videos, films, you can include them in your portfolio, but I would recommend around two to three minutes of, at most to ensure that the admissions committee will watch from beginning to end. Uh, you can submit longer videos, just know that the ed committee will likely start skipping through the video if it's uh, longer than that, so I would be aware of that. And one last thing I want to end on is make now, curate later. Do not be too uh, concerned about curation at this point. Do not be too concerned about what will look good next to what, what order should my portfolio be in. I would uh, encourage you all to really focus on the making aspect while you have the time now. That is what is most important. And then as it gets closer to the deadline, you can start thinking about which pieces you want to exclude from your portfolio and which pieces you want to include. Cool. Thanks, everyone. I hope that was helpful, insightful for the portfolio. Um, yeah, we can switch it over to Q&A now. And also, thanks for bearing with me <laughs> at this very early morning hour. I flubbed a few of those slides. So thank you all again for uh, staying with me. Um, but yeah, let's see. Hey, I don't know if you just uh, um, if you want to make me the co-host, just because I can't for some reason start my video again. <laughs> oh, weird. <laughs> so I'll make you the okay. calls. Cool. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, yeah, so we have one that is, um, you know, kind of a quick one. Is a live figure drawing from a model a good source of drawing from life? Yeah, totally. Um, with figure drawing, though, uh, just be aware that a lot of students will have experience with figure drawing. A lot of students will showcase that in their portfolio, um, but it can still be a wonderful place to draw inspiration or just develop your drawing capabilities. Um, you know, when, when you're drawing from figures as well, be sure, and this goes for all drawings from observation, but be sure you're still experimenting, especially with mark making and other approaches we still want to see your experimental approaches because at the end of the day that'll that is what will make your figure drawings your figure drawings and <laughs> not someone else's um and what else um i've even i saw one student who ripped out all of their figure drawings from their sketchbook and collaged it onto a larger piece of paper i thought that was a nice example of uh still showing us their drawing capabilities but also showing us their creativity and experimentation too uh but yeah the short answer is yes <laughs> <laughs> um this one's not related to the portfolio but it's a little bit of a longer answer so i figured we could answer it um, live. It's about transferring um, and about how flexible the EFS requirements are 
and how transfer credit would play into it. Yeah, um, I'm glad you mentioned transferring. Before I answer that question, I want to clarify. So some of my portfolio tip recommendations would change from this presentation if you're applying as a transfer student. They're mostly the same, but the biggest thing to be aware of is you do apply directly to a major as a transfer. Um, so I would just be aware of that uh, going forward uh, to kind of push your portfolio towards one major or one department, only if you're applying as a transfer, then sorry, uh, I was trying to find the question to answer the rest <laughs> of the parts, um, how flexible the EFS requirements are. So when you transfer, you will likely take a summer EFS course too. It's a six week uh, version of the experimental foundations program over the summer. Um, so you'll likely still have to take it. It is possible to be waived uh, from that program, but you're automatically considered to be waived as we review your application. You'll receive with your decision whether or not you've been waived from that program, but just know uh, it's unlikely to be waived. A lot of students will end up taking the summer EFS program. Um, how transfer credits would play into it. So yeah, so to apply as a transfer, you need at least 27 college credits and at least 12 of those credits need to be in the liberal arts. So courses like humanities, literary arts, history, philosophy, social sciences, art history, that's what those 12 credits would count towards. I think we also count um, math and science towards those liberal arts credits as well. It's just... Uh, um, a lot of students will take a lot of studio courses to prepare for RISD, which is great, but we still want to see at least 12 uh, liberal arts credits of the 27. And yeah, I um, LJ, if you can find our transfer credit policy and put that yes. in the chat, that would be awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. Okay. So as I do that, we have two questions that are similar, so we'll kind of combine them. Mm -hmm. um, does your portfolio need to be kind of curated or specific to um, the major that you choose? Yeah, so transfer students, yes. First year applicants, if you're in high school applying to RISD, no. Um, uh, you are uh, not applying directly to a major as a first year applicant. So your portfolio should reflect uh, different approaches, different mediums, processes. We want to see that you're experimenting and trying different things. More specifically, you're applying to the Experimental Foundation Studies program that I mentioned during the presentation. Uh, that was the big reason why <laughs> I had uh, talked about that program. <laughs> yes. Um, and then this one, again, is not related to the portfolio, but I think you might have Part, you know, partaken in this. <laughs> um, it's a question about the computation technology and culture co concentration. Um, just a little bit about that. Totally. Um, I, yes, LJ was right. I was <laughs> in the uh, computation technology culture concentration. I loved it. I had an amazing time in that program. Um, you can pair it with any uh department at RISD, I'll put a link to their website in the chat too. So computation technology and culture can be paired with any major. It's essentially equivalent of a minor, not a major. Um, so you could pair it with painting, industrial design, whatever, but you couldn't major in that program. Um, but yeah, it's, I uh, can't recommend it enough. It's essentially what you would expect. Um, it's similar to a computer science degree, but specifically for artists. So having said that, it's very different <laughs> than say computer science at uh, other colleges and universities. Um, there's still, you're still very much taking art courses. They, uh, for example, I took digital poetics uh, as a part of that course, um, which was a poetry class or a class on digital poetry. I took a class on programming sound as well, where we would learn um, the programming software. Uh, what was it? Um, I'm blanking on the name. I know we also use Max <laughs> as a software, um, but uh, yeah, we would, it's a lot of programming for artists and designers too. Um, it doesn't have to be a lot of programming, but the introductory, introductory course primarily uses processing, which I actually mentioned during the presentation. So I'll put a link to that in the chat. 
Um, but yeah, other than that, it's a very flexible program too. You have to take one introductory course and one research project. But other than that, you can take whatever courses they offer to count towards it. And all the courses are on their website that I linked in the chat. So this is, I mean, we've answered this one a little bit, um, you know, throughout the presentation and, and talking about, you know, applying for EFS kind of, but um, if you are, if you're interested in a department like interior design, um, but I'll maybe expand this to even animation or, or working specifically in digital medium, um, is it important to also um, include um, you know, to quote the question here, hand painted elements, or um, I'll expand it to to like traditional medium um, in a portfolio. Um, you do not. <laughs> so yeah, so students, uh, just to summarize, applying as a first year, you do not apply directly to a major. Um, so yeah, we don't need to see specific things in your portfolio. Uh, whatever major you put as intended on the common application is not utilized by us in any sort of way, shape or form during the portfolio review. We uh, apply, uh, you are applying to the school generally and to that experimental foundation studies program. So we do like to see variety. We do like to see that you're working outside of your comfort zone. We don't need to see any specific pro approaches um, unless you're applying as a transfer student. Uh, but again, first year students, um, uh, trying to think of how else <laughs> I could say it. Uh, you just, you do not apply directly to a major. Uh, one thing I want to clarify too is the, the question I also saw interior design. We don't offer interior design. Instead, we offer interior architecture, which is very different um, than uh, interior design. And uh, I can include a link to that in the chat as well. Um, but RISD's interior architecture program is very much an architecture program. Um, oh, and then the last thing I was going to say, too, was the school, you don't choose your major until the end of your first year at RISD. So the school deems that if you're admitted to the school, uh, if you make it through that first year program, you're ready for any program of your choice. You are 100% guaranteed into the major of your choice at that point, um, but you wouldn't start your major until your sophomore year. So um, I have a question about unfinished pieces. Um, can we include unfinished pieces in a portfolio um, and, you know, then add a description of kind of what you intend to make? Um, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, it you, you technically can. We, we won't prohibit that, <laughs> but um, I wouldn't recommend it. We do want to see mostly well-developed finished work uh, when we see in progress work, we prefer to see process work. Process work is great to see, but a finished piece sort of halfway through is uh, not what we're looking for. So I wouldn't recommend including in progress work. Um, you know, uh, art, art school portfolios is a great time to experiment. You're not going to make your perfect work <laughs> for that will be your staple for your rest of your life in your art school portfolio. So really feel free to experiment. Think about unconventional solutions. How can I make this painting in a shorter period of time? For example, how can I make this sculpture in a shorter period of time? Uh, finding those unconventional approaches, um, I think uh, to sort of speed up the process would be my recommendation. Yeah, that's a good answer. Um, and then this is a little bit about formatting. So, um, could we put two sketches in one slide if they're of a similar genre? Um, yeah. Um, sure. Yeah. I've also seen students have a video of them flipping throughout their uh, sketchbook. That's okay to submit as well. Just if you do that, I wouldn't recommend um, including your entire sketchbook. <laughs> I would really limit to just the strongest sketches in that scenario, but sure. Um, also, if they are of a similar approach, I would recommend including one or the other, whichever one you think is stronger. You know, I think carefully curating your portfolio is um, good to think about. Uh, so that would be my recommendation. But if the two sketches show very different qualities, if they show different skill sets or different thinkings, then that's okay to include both of them. Yeah. And then one thing I will say too, is that like sometimes we'll see 
um, you know, kind of students group together works on one slide. So they'll put like all their figure drawings on one slide or like all their observational drawings on one slide. Um, that we definitely discourage you from doing. Um, keep, you know, keep kind of thinking about it as like one slide is for like one piece of artwork. Um, so in that way, we don't, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Things get really crowded really easily. So um, it's a little bit confusing to look at when there's multiple kind of things going on on the slide. Couldn't agree more. Just sharing this uh, uh, <laughs> example to reiterate everything LJ's saying. Oh, and then there's um, kind of a clarification so not about a question that we answered a little bit ago about um, unfinished work. And the person says, not an unfinished final piece, but like process work um, of going through the idea. Um, I'm so sorry. Could you repeat that question? That's okay. Um, so the question before was, is it okay to, you know, to submit unfinished or, you know, work in progress? And the person clarified to say not an unfinished final piece, but submitting process work is, is submitting process work. Okay. Yeah. Submitting process work is absolutely okay. Um, just, I wouldn't recommend more than say two to three process pieces in your portfolio. I would encourage you to still include at least 12 well-developed finished pieces in the portfolio. But, uh, aside from that, sure. Um, the process images I encourage are processes that are unconventional. You know, if you built your own drawing tool, if you learned a lot through the process of creating um, your process, or sorry, creating your process work and your final outcome is very different from that. That's exciting for us to see, uh, essentially like nonlinear approaches. Maybe you create one composition, you keep working it over and over again, and then you land on a final one uh, in the final piece. That's cool to see. Um, an example of a process that isn't as exciting for us to see is if we see someone draw out their composition and then execute the same exact composition via painting <laughs> because that's a very linear approach we can usually figure that out just from seeing the final work you know everyone on the admissions committee are all artists we all have uh, experience working as artists so um yeah I, I wouldn't recommend that kind of process but uh creating your own drawing instrument uh showing more experimental approaches go for it and then going off of that, um, a question came up, should process work and the final work be in the same slide? Um, sure, uh, that, that is fine. Just um, no, similar to what uh, LJ was just saying, please don't include more than uh, two to three images in a single slide. Um, we would much uh, prefer to see the video slideshow that I recommended earlier. Um, you can upload a video with each photo one after another. Of maybe I would, in this case, I'd recommend the finished piece first and then showing some of the process images afterward. That way we can scrub through the piece and see it as large as it possibly can be. And then is it preferred to show a variety of work that isn't my best work rather than multiple similar works that I find are my best? Um, I would find a balance between the two. <laughs> um, we do want to see your best work. Uh, quality is more important than quantity. I think it depends on the quality of the variety as well. Um, even when we are when we say we're looking for variety, we're still looking for uh, strong work uh, within your experiments within trying different things. Also, to um, you know, uh, feel free to really uh, yeah, I would recommend building up your skill set in the areas that you think are we you're weak within, uh, weak comparatively weaker within. But um, yeah, feel free to, uh, um, sorry, I was, <laughs> it's so early for me, <laughs> still gathering my brain. Um, yeah, just keep experimenting, um, keep developing your skills within the areas that you aren't quite as confident in. That doesn't mean that you have to do things that you don't want to do, you know, um, but I'd still encourage you to do things that you're excited by. 
also bring your skill set to other areas too like i've seen kind of like why i mentioned with photography how could your photographs become sculptures how could they maybe you collage them onto found objects and now they become sculptures maybe if you're into creating animations maybe you project your animations into different spaces and now it becomes an experiential three-dimensional piece you know there's always ways you can take your strengths and bring them to other mediums it doesn't need to be one ceramics piece one painting piece one architectural piece you know mixed media is also wonderful to see and then this is a question um if you live in a bit of a conservative country is it fine if some of your pieces reflect who you are or should they be in line with your country um, they do not need to be in line uh, with your country. Um, I would encourage you, yeah, to reflect, have your work reflect who you are. If you want to make commentary on your country, go for it. <laughs> That's totally uh, okay. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, we we do want to see um, that you're exploring your personal interests first and foremost with your work. And is text description allowed in the portfolio? Um. Yes, uh, just not on the slide itself. Uh, there is a place to include text descriptions. When it comes to descriptions, I have a few recommendations. One is to please keep it short. <laughs> you know, we have uh, we review thousands of portfolios every year. Uh, we have to go through them fairly quickly. So I uh, do not recommend lengthy descriptions. Um, I once saw a student upload their description as a three-page image <laughs> within the portfolio. <laughs> um, please never, never, never do that. <laughs> Just yeah, uh, there's a reason that there's a character limit within Slide Room for your descriptions. Um, and then my other recommendation is to really give use the descriptions to give us additional context about the work if you choose to do so. Um, don't feel as though you need to write descriptions. I've seen amazing portfolios with no descriptions at all. And I've also seen amazing uh, amazing portfolios with descriptions. It's really at your discretion. But um, my favorite descriptions are ones, again, they provide additional context. Maybe there's a reference to a cultural holiday that you're not 100% sure that the committee will understand the reference. Uh, feel free to include information about it there. Maybe you created your own drawing instrument. In that scenario, I'd recommend including a photo of the drawing instrument. But um, uh, that's another reason you could uh, insert that information in the description. Uh, also use the descriptions to credit collaborators too if you worked with anyone else that's another place to do that and um, yeah it's uh, just to summarize it's allowed but not required and then there's two questions that I'm going to sort of just answer because um, they're not you know super kind of related and I'll, I'll post some links in the chat um, so a question about your personal statement. Um, again, this is focused towards the portfolio, so we won't really go into that here, but we do have some application prep webinars um, that go into the college essay, um, and those can be found on our RISD YouTube page, which I, I just posted in our chat. You can, you can search application prep series in there. Um, and then a question about portfolio days, if we have any um, you know, left for the season. Um, we had our last one, um, you know, for this application season um, last night. And so, um, you know, getting a live review from us is no longer possible, um, but you can get a review from us through the ACAD. Um, you can upload your portfolio um, through this site that I will be posting in the chat as well. Um, and we'll, we'll email you um, feedback through there. Um, so just some quick shout outs to some other, other offerings that we have. Um, and then a little bit, and then a question to answer. Um, <laughs> could you talk a little bit more about sketchbook page submissions? Like, what are you kind of looking for in sketches? Um, what do you usually see? Are they sketches for final pieces or are they separate from final pieces? Um, they can be either for final pieces or separate from final pieces. If they are for final pieces, uh, I go back to what I said about them um, showing 
nonlinear processes, showing experimentation, showing that you're learning through the process of drawing and sketching before creating your final piece. So that you're seeing different iterations of compositions, that is more helpful for us to see. Um, or I'd say a composition that's maybe a little different from the one you landed on. Uh, but they can be sketches on their own too. They can be images from your sketchbook. Uh, sketch. So sketchbook pages. Um, one thing that I, I like to see as a reviewer is different approaches from your final work. So for example, a lot of students are a little less precious about the sketchbook as they are about their finished work. They might uh, work a lot faster within their sketchbook. And um, you can absolutely uh, show different forms of mark making because of that. Uh, sometimes the mark making will be a little bit looser. The approach is a little looser and uh, seeing that different kind of approach is, excuse me, often exciting for us to see within uh, sketchbooks. So yeah, that would be one, one of my recommendations. And then uh, draw from life, you know, <laughs> um, yeah, practice drawing in your sketchbook. Uh, fill out compositions as much as possible. Even in your sketchbook, one thing that not a lot of students uh, think about in their sketchbook um, is composition. Sometimes they'll just throw things around uh, the entire page. Think about how they sit within the border of the page. Think about how all of your different drawings can work together to create one composition. That's exciting for us to see. They don't need to necessarily uh, relate <laughs> conceptually to each other, but just think about how they're placed and the scale and size and stuff is important. Do you prefer to recruit students who already have an excellent ability or students with average ability, but having great potential? That's a good question. Um, I would say both, but there's often crossover <laughs> between the two, you know, I don't, it's rare that we'll see someone who um, we're really excited about their potential, um, but they don't show a lot of technical capability. It does happen sometimes, um, but depending on the capacity of that, uh, that could affect their admission. What I mean by that is um, we want to make sure that we feel as though they're prepared for RISD. We want to make sure that they uh, won't struggle uh, uh, once they get here within their drawing and spatial design and all of these different courses that they have to take. Um, but uh, potential is hugely important for us though. We want to see creative unconventional approaches. Absolutely. Would you agree with that LJ or? Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. And I think too, like, so, yeah, sometimes that stuff is like hand in hand. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. And keep in mind, technical capability doesn't always mean drawing realistically. <laughs> too. Yeah. Um, that was one of the things I want to emphasize in this presentation was uh, ex strong formal skills can look like so many different things, too. Uh, that's um, if you want to learn more about that, just rewatch the presentation. <laughs> we'll have a link to uh, portfolio tips on the YouTube page as well. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Um, this question, this next question, I'm going to kind of, um, gear into a different direction. I guess I'm not entirely sure of the intention, but, um, the question is, is coherence of the artworks included in my portfolio or diversity more important, which we've talked about, you know, experimentation and variety of, of medium, but, um, you know, we got a lot of questions about thematic diversity or, um, you know, is it okay to work in a theme? Um, so if you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, um, your work, uh, that's actually one of the very few areas where we don't have any preference <laughs> at all. Um, when it comes to theme, it's totally up to you. If everything's thematically coherent, great. If every single piece dives into completely different themes, subject matters, concepts, also awesome, equally as awesome for us. So it's totally up to you. Within that regard, we have no preference when it comes to a theme. We're mostly just concerned that your work is uh, really specific to you as an individual. Yeah, yeah. There's some. There's so many different reasons why we get interested in making work too. So sometimes <laughs> that can be just working in one 
theme or something too. Totally. <laughs> yeah. And keep in mind what we look for is different than say AP art and IB art um, where they, they do want to see a theme. Um, but uh, yeah, we, what we look for is a little different. We're just more trying to see your autistic profile as a whole. Let's see. Okay. How is the portfolio weighted when applying to the Brown RISD program? Um, it's, I would mostly be concerned about RISD <laughs> with the portfolio. <laughs> um, the way the Brown RISD dual degree program works is you apply to each school individually and then, oh, the two schools will share a list of who's been admitted to both schools, and then there will be a Brown RISD dual degree committee that reviews those applicants. So you do need to be admitted to RISD individually first, as well as Brown individually first. Um, so yeah, there's the, what the dual degree committee uh, looks about and thinks about with portfolios isn't any different than what the RISD admissions uh, committee thinks about with portfolios, to the best of my knowledge. Mm -hmm. Okay, that is all of the questions that we've received so far. Um, we still have about five minutes. So if anybody has any other ones, now is your chance. Yes. <laughs> Type them in the Q&A chat box. It's a rare opportunity to have two admissions <laughs> officers available to answer your questions immediately. Yes, <laughs> so. definitely. <laughs> I'm trying to think if I have any. And I don't think that I, I can think of any right now. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yeah, I'm trying to think of some as well. Um, there are uh, recordings of this presentation, the portfolio tips on the uh, uh, YouTube page that LJ put a link to in the chat too, if you want to rewatch this presentation. Yes, yeah. This isn't really a question, but... Um... I don't know. We both have done it before. Um, this person says, I don't know why I'm really nervous about getting into, into uni, into school. Yeah. I mean, I was too <laughs> when I was in high school. <laughs> I'm not sure if uh, you relate LJ, um, but yeah, it's a, it's a stressful process and that's why we're here to help and answer your questions. Absolutely. Um, it is stressful, but uh you know, if, um, it's uh, once you're in university, you're there <laughs> too, and yeah. you can always transfer later on. Yes. Let's see. Um, for graphic design specific projects, what type of projects would you recommend? Um, what is strong, you know, for graphic design? Um, graph. So one thing I want to encourage with design work is to still think about everything that I mentioned in the presentation that might on surface seem geared towards drawing and painting, for example, mark making texture, um, scale, lighting, all of these things are just as relevant with graphic design work as they are drawing and painting. Um, so that would be my number one recommendation is to really kind of internalize, think about that. Um, yeah, think about how you can utilize all of these different approaches. And I'm not saying every single piece has to have uh, lots of texture in your graphic design work, uh, lots of lighting in your graphic design work, but still consider how they can be shown in unconventional processes. And also think about uh, how your graphic design work can um, be really specific to you and really show, uh, yeah, again, unconventional processes. I know I keep saying that over and over again, but it's because it's important. Um, uh, one artist that I'd recommend checking out is Aristi alumni is Jenny Holzer. Um, she's a sculptor who utilizes text in a lot of interesting and exciting ways and thinking about projection and electronics with the use of text. So as far as like typography, graphic design goes, um, she's not a graphic designer, but I think she's a amazing person for uh, people who like create graphic design to look at. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good, yeah, I like that reference. <laughs> um, is it possible that a strong portfolio and essay can overcome academic backgrounds? Yes, um, it is possible, but within reason. So what I mean by that is we 
if there's significant concern in your application that you wouldn't be successful in your liberal arts courses, then um, that will uh, that would be most important to us as we look through the application. Uh, we still want to see that you're keeping up with your grades. What I'll say is if you are concerned about your grades, if you're concerned about your GPA, um, if we see improvement over time, that means a ton to us. If we, if we, Even if you have a low GPA early on, but we see you're continually improving from year to year, that's very, very important to us and can have a big uh, effect on the admissions decision. But, you know, if you have one C here or there in AP calculus, uh, that, you know, I wouldn't be too concerned to uh, um, you're applying to art school <laughs> after all, and I think a strong portfolio could outweigh um, some transcripts that students might have, have concern over, definitely. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, for this, we don't have any more questions, and for the sake of time, um, maybe we'll, we'll end it here. Um, thank you so much, Zach, for conducting this webinar today. Mm -hmm. I did put our email in the chat too. Um, if you continue to have any questions, you know, later today or or even months from now, um, you can you can reach us there at admissions at risd.edu. Cool. Awesome. Thanks, LJ. Thank you very yeah. much for assisting. Thanks everyone for joining and asking uh, all the questions. I hope it was helpful. Uh, as LJ mentioned, feel free to reach out anytime and best of luck, everyone. Have a great Thank day. You, <laughs> Bye.